In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. And so today we're going to start our series on first uh, on the first epistle of St. Peter. And what we're going to try to do is go uh, verse by verse, or like at least section by section, and get through um, as much as possible in the time uh, that's reasonable. And uh, we'll just carry on each Saturday uh, evening uh, at 7.30. Uh, you can join uh, through Zoom, or you can um, watch on YouTube after we upload the videos. And so we'll go ahead and get started with a small introduction on St. Peter. Um, and we know a lot of um, the ministry of St. Peter is he's found pro uh, prominently in the first half of, of the book of Acts. And that's when you find, um, when you examine the first part of the book of Acts, we find St. Peter and he's preaching in Jerusalem and Palestine, and he's bringing the gospel to the Gentiles of Caesarea, and he is arrested by Herod's men. And then we know that he's released by a miracle. And then he's gone, right? After St. Peter's miraculous escape from prison and his visit to, um, and his visit to the brethren to tell them about all this, St. Luke records in the book of Acts chapter 12, he says, then he departed and went to another place. And that's it. That's all we hear about uh, about St. Peter until we catch up with him in Rome, writing two epistles, and finally being martyred under Nero in about 65. Yeah, it's around 65. So for St. Peter, one can conclude that his primary focus was obeying his Lord and bringing the gospel to the whole world, and that was more important than leaving a detailed account of how he did it. And so uh, we can we can conclude that Saint Peter is indeed the the one who wrote the first epistle um, of Saint Peter. Now there is some controversy or some talk about it could have been at the hand of Silvanus um, called Silas in the book of Acts chapter fifteen, but mainly it's agreed that Saint Peter is the one who who wrote the epistle mainly because if you look at Saint Peter's sermons I mentioned in the book of Acts and compare it to the epistles, you see a lot of comparisons in um, his examples and things like that. And here's just a few to, um, to note on the screen. And it's possible that a simple fisherman, he could write in such good and polished Greek um, using the Greek Septuagint for, um, you know, for example, his Old Testament citations or references. It's more likely that, you know, the polished Greek came as a result of using a secretary. And so then the conclusion is that Sylvanus was indeed the actual writer, right? The secretary, if you will. And it would account also for this kind of Pauline feel to the first epistle of the first, uh, first Peter, because, you know, as we know, Sylvanus was a friend of St. Paul. Um, in, in first Peter chapter five, we hear the phrase delivered by Sylvanus. It can also mean written by Sylvanus, um, some interpretations. Uh, some would suggest that St. Peter actually dictated the letter, uh, maybe in Aramaic. And so this would have given Sylvanus really a lot of editorial freedom to phrase things as he wished in, in the Greek. And so if this is so, it would, it would also account for the differences in the Greek between the first epistle and the second epistle. Um, because the, the first epistle Greek is a lot more polished than it is for the second epistle. Um, so it's also possible for Sylvanus to be the bearer of the epistle, right? And so uh, there is definitely a connection to Sylvanus, and but mainly it's, it's you know, agreed that St. Peter was the writer, if, you know, whether he physically wrote it or if he um, dictated it. Uh, to whom it was written. So, uh, you know, the, the place the place of writing uh, is clear. It, the letter was written uh, from Rome, uh, called Babylon in chapter five. Um, the, the epistle was sent as a circular to Christians um, in the empire. And so Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, this is in, in chapter one, verse one, the, the five different kind of regions. And it's possible that St. Peter, he visited these communities on his way to Rome and he wrote to them on, on, um, to strengthen uh, the context that he previously made. And it's equally possible that St. Peter had not been there, but the situation may have been even uh, brought up by Sylvanus, for example, 
uh, who accompanied Paul to Galatia, for example, in chapter 16 of Acts. And maybe it was Silvanus who urged St. Peter to write to, um, to these people. And so, you know, um, the date of the epistle is also fixed, you know, fairly precisely. Um, how do we know this? Because a few things. Number one, we know that St. Paul was imprisoned in Rome around 60, and then he was released about two years later in 62. So St. Peter is not mentioned by St. Luke in the book of Acts as being in Rome during this time. And, and actually St. Paul doesn't mention, um, uh, mention St. Peter in his letters uh, written during his imprisonment. So it seems as if Peter was not, uh, he didn't arrive in Rome until after maybe Paul had left. So we know there was a great fire of Rome in, in, in July of 64. And so we know that um, St. Peter was executed in the persecution that followed the Great Fire. And so it would place St. Peter's arrival in Rome around 62, but maybe before 64, around that time frame. And so most likely he wrote the epistle, the first epistle, around the winter of 63 or the beginning of 64. Um, there's some uh, simple characteristics of the epistle. It, it's actually, it has a, um, a similar feel to some of St. Paul's letters. Uh, that's why people um, kind of uh, see the, the Silvanus connection, uh, especially in books like uh, Ephesians and Romans and Galatians. Um, we, see, we know that in St. Peter's style, he takes a lot from the Old Testament um, and he actually refers to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ because in fact, he was an eyewitness to what our Lord said and did. Um, and the purpose of this epistle is clear. Um, the, the Christians of this area had experienced persecution. And so St. Paul, being pastoral, encourages them to remain steadfast. Um, and, and, you know, this epistle is uh, an excellent source of comfort. Um, and every chapter is filled with a comforting message. He reminds the people of their responsibilities, their duties as the elect, right? Um, special people. Uh, and he reveals a very practical, uh, you know, how do we deal with our family and society and the church um, and all these kind of things? And so he basically instructs them to, uh, as their proper conduct. Um, opposition to the Christians at that time was, was growing throughout the empire um, so that Nero found them a, a convenient scapegoat, the Christians. But, um, and so that would, this persecution would come after the great fire of Rome and St. Peter wrote this epistle to the Christians who were being pressured because of their faith and who needed encouragement to persevere and instruction on how to interact with an increasingly hostile society. In our day, when Christians are under pressure, increasingly under pressure from secular forces, you know, we can, we can really go to St. Peter's words uh, and, and they really resonate very well for us today in our day and age. Uh, so it's very practical. The theme is really, you know, cohesively, it's the conduct becoming of the people of God. And, and so there's only five chapters. And so uh, I hope, you know, every Saturday to take a large chunk and hopefully we'll get to um, midway of chapter one today and we'll see how it goes. But uh, St. Peter starts in chapter one about salvation in Christ and sufferings. And then our relation with Christ um, in terms of our societal relations, our family relations, tribulations, and our church relations in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's get started on chapter one, because uh, I would like to, to take significant portions as much as possible. So we'll start with chapter one. I'll read the first couple of verses, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, chapter one, verse one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the pilgrims of the dispersion of Pon in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and grace to you and peace be multiplied. And so this letter opens as most apostolic letters. And, and you know, it's interesting. St. Peter doesn't claim superiority, uh, which is interesting. Uh, St. Peter, although he's writing to Gentiles in, in this epistle, he actually gives the Gentiles amazing titles uh, that were generally characterized for Jews. Since these Gentiles, through their faith, have become God's people, they are deserving of these titles, the elect. Right? It's, a, it's a very special title. And so the Jews that are living outside of Palestine are called the diaspora. 
And so St. Peter refers to the recipients of this letter as living in Pontius and Galatia and Cappadocia by this, uh, by this title of the chosen people or the elect, um, like the Jews of old. But unlike the Jews of old, their true homeland was not in Palestine, but in heaven. And while living on earth, they are exiles from their true, from their true home. You know, St. John Climacus, he defines what it means to be a pilgrim. He says, being pilgrims means forsaking all tempor temporal matters on earth, which hinder achieving our goal in the spiritual life. Pilgrimage is a humble behavior, hidden wisdom, knowledge about uh, which most people do not know, a hidden life, unseen goals, invisible meditation, longing for humility, desiring for suffering, permanent determination on God's love, abundant blessings, and rejecting vainglory in deep silence. And so, Pilgrimage is carrying the human soul with all of our energy to overcome sufferings and tribulations for the love of God. The, the, order, the order actually of the cities that are mentioned in the first verse is interesting. Um, it's significant because it represents the order that someone who's bearing the letter would reach uh, these different cities as he traveled towards Rome, right? As we know, all roads lead to Rome. So actually, if, you, if you're traveling that way, you would reach um, uh, Pontius first in Galatia and Cappadocia. So it's very interesting that that was pretty significant. Um, uh, and, you know, as we notice, as St. As Peter is addressing the Gentiles, he doesn't just simply offer a greeting, but he's, he goes straight to reminding them of how God has changed them. And, and he reminds them of their true identity. Um, because, you know, they're under pressure to conform to the world around them. They must remember who they are now and refuse to conform because they're pilgrims. They're, they're, they're not part of this world any longer because God the Father, the maker of all men, has chosen them according to his foreknowledge, right? That is that, that God knew from the foundation of the world who would be humble and open-hearted and, and these he transforms in holy baptism, making them his sons through Jesus Christ. This baptismal conversion um, in the sanctification of the spirit. This is verse two. The, the baptismal conversion occurs in the sanctification of the spirit. So the term sanctification here refers to the change from darkness to light, from the, from the convert's passage from the power of Satan to that of God. And they are sanctified in that they now belong to God. And this transformation of regeneration is accomplished by the spirit. And so the result of this baptismal regeneration is their obedience and sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. So, you know, in their former days as pagans, they disobeyed God and they didn't keep his law. But now they live in obedience and strive after righteousness. And we see the connection that St. Peter is trying to make here. Just as the people of Israel were sprinkled with the blood of sacrifice as they entered into a covenant with God, so these Gentile Christians were sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ and cleansed of their sins. And this sprinkling refers to the shedding of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which cleanses his disciples as they partake of the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Their baptism leads them to a life of continued obedience and cleansing, and thus making them different from the world around them. And it's to these saints, right, these people that St. Peter desires God to multiply his grace and his peace. Since all of the epistles is centered on the sufferings and the life of the believer, it was necessary for St. Peter to start with the topic of salvation, right? The, the Holy Trinity offers us an indescribable love for us. Discovering God's sacrificing love is the incentive behind someone who can endure sufferings with thanksgiving to that extent. And so, therefore, that's why St. Peter talks about the Father's love, declared in his choice of man. He talks about the love of the Holy Spirit, declared in our sanctification by, by obedience. And then he talks about the love of the Son of God, right, declared on the cross. And so we see the Trinity really like clearly appearing, uh, appearing in the first two verses of this epistle. Very clearly, the Father's love declared in his choice as the elect, in the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, uh, declared in, in the sanctification of obedience and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Trinity is very clear from the very beginning. In verse three, he says, 
Blessed be God the Father, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so St. Peter addresses converts who feel the pressure of the world that's around them. And so he begins by reminding them of the great reward awaiting them if they resist this pressure and they cling to their faith in Christ. As a side note, um, letters in those days, they customarily began with a prayer of thanksgiving. And St. Peter begins with this kind of prayer. This is, so um, it, we, as we look at verse three, it's the start of a prayer. So in your, in your Bible, if you're taking notes or marking your, your Bible, I would you know, maybe underline verse three as a start of the prayer. It's a, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. Um, but the, the, the overwhelming um, realization of God's mercy actually um, takes St. Peter away. This prayer doesn't conclude until verse 12. It's kind of like one long sentence, one long prayer that starts at verse three and ends at verse 12. And so you might want to mark that section as, as one single prayer. Um, and so, you know, hopefully my goal today is to, to get through this prayer by to, to verse 12, if we have the time for it. So in his opening prayer, St. Peter explodes in thanksgiving, and he declares, blessed be God, right? For God is the one who manifested his love for men in the gospel, and, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For according to his great mercy, <clears throat> Upon those who had no claim of his favor, he regenerates us. He has begotten us again, right? Um, granting a new birth through baptism. And then, you know, St. Didymus the Blind said, when we are submerged in the baptismal font because of the goodness of God the Father and the grace of the Holy Spirit, we are washed from our sins and we are renewed from the old man and are sealed by his power to be his own. When we come out of the baptismal font, we put on Christ our Savior as a new garment worthy of the honor of the Holy Spirit who renewed us and sealed us. And so <clears throat> this re regeneration came to the, to the new converts through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And that is, the risen life of Christ was bestowed on them in baptism. So they now share the power of that resurrection. And this baptism has also bestowed on them a living hope. This is verse three, a living hope, the certainty that they will receive an inheritance of life and joy in the age to come. And so we go on to verse four. <clears throat> to an inheritance, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through uh, faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is one of my favorite verses in the beginning chapter. It's such an amazing promise. This inheritance is something to look forward to. It's, it's filled with blessings. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It's unfading. Um, why is it incorruptible? Because the glory given to us will be forever. It will have no end. And God is immortal. It's undefiled because it remains pristine, unsullied. Right? It's awaiting the time in which we will inherit. It's unfading because it's countless. Our Lord is, is endless. And so it, it never fades away. It never diminishes its brilliance. And so this inheritance and this reward is kept by God. It's kept in heaven for, for all of us who, who uh, can persevere. Um, it's out of the reach of any of the persecuting men. And they you know, should feel satisfied or rest assured that their inheritance is safe and guarded and will be there for them when they reach the end. And, you know, they may be confident for, of, of safely reaching the end. It, it, you know, in moments of persecution, can you imagine, like, we, we would all be tempted to think of themselves as vulnerable and weak and, and to think that maybe even the, this temptation of sin to think that God has abandoned them. But St. Peter is saying, this is not the case. No, they are guarded by the power of God, by, by himself so that they will inherit the salvation that has already been prepared for them and is even now ready to be revealed at the last appointed time at the second coming. His power guards them through faith. As long as they cling to their confession of our Lord Jesus Christ, God will bring them to a triumphant end in his kingdom. So 
it, it led us and let them right be bold and confess Christ before the whole world. Because if we do, if they do, God will see them. They will, he will see us safely home. And the persecutors might take their property, they might take their lives, but they can't really touch them. That's what St. Peter is saying. Their, their inheritance cannot be taken away. It's reserved for them in heaven. It's such a, a beautiful promise of what's to come. And then verses 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though tested, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you uh, love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your, of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so it's, it's, they can exult, they can leap for joy, even though now, if necessary, that is, if, if God wills, if, if God thinks it's best, that they may be made sorrowful by various testings. And it could be, you know, slander, it could be gossip, it could be all different kinds of persecution. It could be physical uh, persecution as they were facing, but in our day and age. And yes, the, these, these things are, these trials are, are very hard to endure, but the persecution of this age is really in the grand scheme of things, it's just for a little while compared to the eternity of glory that will follow. And so he compares to gold, just like gold that perishes is proven by fire. So the proof of their faith which is more precious than gold, is in their sufferings. So we know that gold must pass through fire to be proven, to be found pure, so that their faith also must pass through the flames if it's to be found uh, pure and, and to result in the praise and glory and honor of them at the revelation of Jesus Christ in the last day. And, and that final revelation of Christ will be amazing. Not having seen him in their life, not having seen him even now, they still love him and they still believe in him and exult with inexpressible and glorified joy. And that is, you know, even though they do not know, uh, they do not now see him, they rejoice with a joy that defies description, a joy that, par that the partakers of glory of heaven. So how much more will they exult and, and rejoice because when they finally see him face to face? Right? Because of this faith and this love for Christ, they will receive back as their faith's end and goal the salvation of their souls. And so by soul, St. Peter means their life. Right? The world may insist that Christians are wasting their lives in a service to Jesus Christ. But St. Peter asserts that they are saving their souls. Okay? Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and search carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ that the glories that would follow, and the glories that would follow. This salvation is so great that even the prophets who prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures sought out and examined out the whole issue searching their own utterances to discover who or what kind of appointed time the spirit within them was making a plan. And so the spirit here is called the spirit of Christ because the spirit speaking through the prophets pre-witnessed to the sufferings of Christ and, and, and to his exaltation that would follow after these sufferings. And so, <clears throat> you know, these words like um, sought out and examined um, show the, how greatly you know the prophets wanted to discover whether this grace and salvation was to come to them in their day. That salvation was so wonderful they could hardly wait. But it was revealed to them by God that they were not serving themselves and their own generation. No, they were serving St. Peter's hearers, us, right? Those who are living in a Christian era, uh, whose recipients were now have now been announced through. Uh, those who preach the good news. The, the wonderful salvation the prophets predicted has come to pass in the lives of the hearers of St. Peter. And we come to verse 12, and I think this is where I want to end for today. To them, it was revealed that 
not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering these things which now have been reported to you through uh, those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. And so St. Peter refers to the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ as preached by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And the reference is the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit, um, when the Spirit first was sent by Christ upon his church. We know this is Acts chapter 2. The Spirit who still abides in the church and is received through the holy baptism and chrismation. St. Peter stresses that the same Spirit who gave the prophecies in ancient times now inspires the apostles to interpret them correctly as being fulfilled in Christ. So St. Peter ends his description of the greatness of their salvation, this long sentence that started in verse 3, by saying that it is into such glorious things that even the angels desire to look into. The salvation of the Christians is so wonderful that even angels watching from heaven, they long to have a better look and see all the details of their, of their salvation's fulfillment. What a great privilege, therefore, is theirs. And so I wanted to stop here today. Next time, we'll start at verse 13 for the sake of time. And we'll, we'll answer any questions that we uh, possibly have.